Okay, folks, so this is the continuation of the class lecture that we would have had if we didn't have that uh, fiasco with Governor Cuomo on uh, Thursday. I'm going to pick up with my PowerPoint presentation. I think we're up to slide 10 or 11. I'm talking about what philosophy is, and now I want to talk about how that's related to the degrees that you uh, go for in college, right? You know, so you start out, most community college students are going for an associate's degree in science, so A of Associate of Arts, AA, or Associate of Science, AS. It means you're associated with knowledge, with learning, right? Like someone who's associated with you. He's not a friend, but he's an associate, you know? Is he a friend? No, just an associate. All right, next degree, a bachelor's degree, a bachelor of arts or sciences, BA or BS. A bachelor can sort of date knowledge and get close and intimate with it, right? The word bachelor has that meaning. Next degree, master of arts, a master's degree, or master of science. You master knowledge, right? Highest academic you could get, academic degree you could get is the PhD. PH stands for philosophy and D stands for doctorate. You're a doctor of philosophy in whatever subject. Could be in math, in biology, a doctor of philosophy, in philosophy, in physics, doesn't matter. Right? You're a doctor of knowledge, um, like a doctor of thinkology, right? What does a doctor do? A doctor can diagnose what the situation is, figure out what its cause was, tell you the prognosis, how it's going to turn out, uh, and prescribe things to fix something when it's wrong, like a doctor, right? So this is a doctor of thinkology. That's what a PhD is, and it's general, right? Whether it's in any subject, it doesn't matter. When you come back at the highest level, even if it's a PhD in biology, then it becomes questions about, like, what is life? Or if it's psychology, what is the mind? That sort of thing. Okay, so philosophy is at the highest level of every other area of sort of, of human, of academic or scholarly research anyway. There are other problems. If you recall, this is all about so far problems defining philosophy, right? Now the world has different philosophical frameworks, right? So it's hard. Like Western philosophers is all about arguing and reasoning and analyzing and debating like logic and you know, science and things like that. Whereas in Asian philosophy, for instance, Buddhists sit quieting their mind in meditation trying to stop thought, and that's philosophical activity for them. So we think philosophy requires all this kind of analytic thought, and their approach is opposite, quiet the mind. Right? There's this image that they have about stilling the mind like stilling a lake. When the lake is all choppy and there's waves on the surface, the moon is, doesn't reflect neatly in the water, but when everything is calm, the surface is like a sheet of glass and it reflects the moon perfectly. Right? So when the mind is calm, it's clear, and then it reflects reality. Right? That's what the mind is for. So all these thoughts and words, you know, just sort of separate perception and consciousness from seeing clearly. That's the view from the other side. In Indian philosophy, in Buddhism, Hinduism. Right? Totally radically different about a view about philosophy in African uh, culture. Right? There's a belief in the supernatural and the natural blended together. Right? And the elders have like one foot in the supernatural world. Right? And uh, the medicine man, voodoo, you know, you might perform tribal dance to get into a trance and like be in the spirit. Right? That counts in a way as philosophical. Native Americans do the same thing. Right? They might even take like uh, magic mushrooms or psychedelic peyote or something like that to put them in the spirit world. Right? These are their beliefs, just like uh, in the Western world we have ours. Right? So there's radically different ways of looking at things that count as philosophy. Some Western philosophers might say, no, those other things are more like religion. This is another question. What separates religion from philosophy? They both address the same questions. Why am I here? Is there a God? Was the world ever, um, you know, did it have a beginning? Was it created? What's the purpose of life? You know, how should I live? Those are all the deep and meaningful questions. Religion asks all those questions, and every religion answers them. The difference is, most major religions have a kind of system of authority that goes back to some ancient scripture or book, like the Bible or the Quran. And not only those, but even in Hinduism and other ones, right? Um, the Torah and Judaism and so on. Now, another... But that's a minor thing, but there's something right about, uh, important about the fact that they're in books and authority. It's a kind of collection of answers, 
Right? Religions don't only ask the questions, but they provide a system of answers. And most religions focus on those answers and like these are the answers. And you're just supposed to accept that. And it's sort of not appropriate to question that. Whereas philosophy is all about questioning. So you might want to say philosophy is a kind of questionism and religion is more like answerism. You know, philosophers ask religious folks when they get the answers from them, well, how do you know that? What's your reason for believing that? Because it's in the book. Who wrote the book? He did. How do you know he, he's telling the truth? You know, that sort of thing. So there's a tension between philosophy and religion, but not necessarily. Many religious believers are philosophers and vice versa. All right? But the final and maybe the biggest problem is that even within the same tradition, like Buddhism, you've got all these differences of opinion, different schools of thought, and they all radically disagree about what counts as philosophy. You know, biologists don't biologists don't disagree about what counts as biology. Mathematicians don't disagree about what counts as mathematics, right? Math is math. You know, it's universal, that sort of thing, right? That's the way science and math are. The philosophers are a more problematic bunch. They're very deep thinking, but they radically disagree even about the fundamentals of deep thinking, okay? All right, so here's my rough definition of philosophy. I took it from one of my meditation teachers. Her name is Dhamma Dana. Her definition of meditation is, meditation is extraordinary attention to ordinary experience. Extraordinary just means above ordinary, like more than ordinary attention to ordinary experience. Everybody pays attention to ordinary experience, but meditation is when you do that intentionally in a heightened way and you practice having more and more attentiveness to the present moment, whether you're paying attention to your breathing, your senses, uh, a thought, uh, whatever, washing dishes, sitting, meditating, it doesn't matter how you meditate, it involves a heightened awareness, right? So based on that idea, her definition, meditation is extraordinary attention to ordinary experience, right? Like breathing, walking, whatever those are ordinary experiences. Philosophy, in my, on my rough and ready definition, is extraordinary examination of ordinary experience. Just change that one word. Instead of attention, examination. You could pay attention to something by just watching it without really trying to analyze it or examine its nature. Right? Philosophical attention is more like examination, the way doctors and scientists and mechanics examine things and take them apart, try to figure out how they work. Right? There's a way in which Buddhist meditators examine experience, right? but there's a way of meditating that might not involve examination, so I'm not sure. Right? It's just an attempt to give some kind of a, a, you know, a definition. No definitions are, are perfect. Right? I like to add this other thing, though. Okay, um, philosophy is extraordinary examination of ordinary experience, but also of the concepts and language and beliefs and views and theories and principles that come out of ordinary experience. So, for instance, when you're a baby, you just have experiences, sounds and smells and tastes, and you don't know what they are. You don't have words for them. But then you learn words and concepts. Words are just the names for concepts, the concept of bottle or mom. Right? And you have the word bottle or mom that associates with that idea. Right? So that's what like, comes out of experience of having bottles put in your mouth a lot and your mom saying bottle, bottle, and so on and so on. Mom, mom. Right? Baby's first word, mom. Um, right? That comes out of experience. And then as you have more and more experience, beliefs formulate about mom is the one who gives me the bottle. And, you know. What's in the bottle is milk, and milk is good for your teeth, and things like that, right? Those are beliefs, and then you, the more you have beliefs you have, you put them together, and you formulate views and theories about the way the world is, and how it works, and so on, right? And you, uh, children start to realize, oh, dreams might not be real, whereas when I'm awake, that's real, right? Those are views about reality, what's real and what's not real. It becomes more and more complicated principles about how you should live, and what's right and wrong, and what matters. All that values that all comes out of experience, it seems to anyway, from a certain perspective. And like Western philosophers focus on all of that stuff more. Beliefs, views, values, principles, theories, right? But it really, all of that is, in a sense, a subset of experience. And yet, in a sense, some things, even though we learn about them from experience, they seem to be independent of experience. Like two plus two is four, and it would be whether or not anybody ever had an experience, right? So... These definitions are problematic. All right. Last thing I want to say about what philosophy is and the difference between 
you and me perhaps and Socrates, right? And a, a child who asks why a lot, you know, there's differences of degree. Who's more or less philosophical? Who cares? The only difference really technically between professional philosophers and, and others who philosophize, like amateur philosophers or kids who are philosophical, it's a matter of degree, but and that might not, you know, you might not be a professional philosopher, but be more philosophical than me and Socrates put together, right? But professional philosophers have a degree, and they studied and they get paid to do that, right? They're lucky if that's what they love to do. I, I happen to love to do that, so I was always philosophical as a kid, and uh, my dream came true. Where I got to get paid thinking about things that it, it interest me and excite me, all right? So uh, the joke that I like to tell people is that, yeah, when I was a teenager, me and my friends, you know, used to hang out and ask questions like, how do we know we're real? And like, we're not the figure of some figure, you know, like, a, what is it? A figment in someone's, couldn't think of the word figment, a figment in someone else's imagination, you know? <sighs> what do you think? Right? That's the joke. Um, all right. So moving right along. Uh, last thing I'll say about it, the difference between any of these kinds of people matters of degree. All right. Now, there are three major areas, and this is the last way of trying to get at what philosophy is, three major divisions that could be made, three major areas in philosophy. Right? One is the study of knowledge and belief and related states like that, informational states. How do you know good from bad information? What's the difference between knowledge and belief? Are there criteria? What are the criteria you have to satisfy to, to know that these beliefs are true? Right? Um, the next one is the study of reality. Oh, the first one is called epistemology. The second one is called metaphysics, the study of reality. Right? What does something have to do in order for us to say it's real or that it really exists? Right? Are thoughts real? Is time real? Or are only things that we can touch and measure and so on real? Then the third field, major field of philosophy, is about the study of value, value judgments. In a sense, our beliefs and thoughts and knowledge are in our heads. They're part of our minds. They're subjective. They're in the subject. I'm the subject of experience. The world exists outside of my mind. The moon exists whether or not I perceive it in some way. It's objective, right? It's an object that exists outside of the subject of experience. So subjective in the mind, objective out of the mind. What about value judgments? When you say something is beautiful, is it a feature of that thing that's beautiful or is it something in your mind that likes the way that it looks or tastes or sounds, right? So are values subjective, objective, or some kind of blend? That's the study of value judgments and what criteria there are for them is called axiology. Okay, here's some samples of fields, subfields in axiology, aesthetics. That's all those judgments about beauty, art, music, fashion, right? That kind of thing. Um, economics is certainly a, a field of value, right? Good services, capital, currency. Those values go up and down. Are they objective, subjective? They seem to be somewhat subjective because if people panic about something, the market collapses, right? But then there's certainly something objective about money. There's an objective sort of laws in economics, right? And then, of course, ethics. What makes something right or wrong? good or evil, moral or immoral, right? What's the difference between that and law? Legal, illegal, moral, immoral, right? So those are some fields of value judgment. There are other fields of philosophy, like logic, which per, you know, permeates everything else. It's a study of reasoning. Every, every other field of human knowledge involves logic, right? Um, and then there are particular philosophies, philosophy of this, philosophy of that, social philosophy, political philosophy, philosophy of religion, philosophy of law, philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, you name it for any field. There's a philosophy. So the three major fields, epistemology, metaphysics, and axiology, study of knowledge, study of reality, study of values, we'll talk a little bit about each of them. First, epistemology. What does it mean to say correctly, I know? Right? What criteria must be satisfied? How do you know whether or not you know? Who's to say? Right? Are there true facts? Some people don't think there are. Here's a straightforward uh, theory about what knowledge is. It's just, it's nothing more than having a true belief. You believe something, like you believe today is Saturday, and it's true. Today is Saturday. If you believe it and it is true, then you know today is Saturday. And that's a common sense view about what knowledge is. You might see a movie and you're watching it and you go, I know what's going to happen. And then it does. And you go, see, I knew it. Right? But that might not be all that it takes to really have knowledge. Plato thought so. He said, no, that's not quite right. 
Imagine a crooked prosecutor who finds out through illegal means that so-and-so, let's say Jones, committed a murder. All right? So he wants to prosecute Jones, and he, he pays some guy who was in the cell with Jones in prison. He locks him up, you know, pays the guy who was in the cellmate to lie and say he confessed he was bragging about killing him. Right? He pays some bum off the street to say he saw, he was hiding in the alleyway drinking wine. He saw Jones commit the murder and so on. So you get all these fake witnesses who lie to the jury. Now the jury hears all this, apparently, what seems to be good evidence, and they formulate the belief that Jones is the killer. And it happens to be true. Plato thought, they don't know. That's not what you mean by knowledge. They happen to have a true belief. They have a whole bunch of reasons for it, but they're not the right kind of reasons. So Plato thought, somehow or another, the reasons that you believe something is true have to be connected directly in the right kind of way. Ignore that bird chirping sound. That's my phone. The, the reasons you have for believing that something is true have to be connected in the right kind of way with its being true in some way. But Plato thought, it would be hard to really spell that out, but you need something more than just a true belief. Right? So well, what's the difference between belief and knowledge? Right? Obviously, belief alone doesn't get you knowledge, but what... Neither does truth. Belief and truth aren't enough. What's, the, what's that third thing? All right. Okay. Metaphysics, the study of reality. What does it mean to say something is real? What does it mean to say it exists? All right. What criteria must be satisfied? All right. Common sense view of metaphysics. We don't use the word, but common sense view of reality. What criteria for reality? Can you see it, smell it, taste it, hear it, or touch it? All right. Or detect it with the use of some other kind of instrumentation? Right? If those are your criteria for reality, knock on it, you can knock on it, it's real, that kind of thing. Seeing is believing, right? Okay, if so then, here's a problem for you. Can you see or hear or smell, etc., time or consciousness? You might see what you take to be effects of it, and you might infer that there must be time, right? Just like you see you know, uh, leaves blowing in the wind, and so you assume that there's wind. Right. There are ways to measure wind, however, and find it. When we measure time, it's not quite the same thing. Right. Here's an analogy, a comparison, rather a contrast. When water flows into the house through a pipe in the basement, the water turns a wheel that registers on the meter and you pay for those gallons because water is a stuff, a substance that pushes a wheel. Time doesn't push the wheels in your clock, the little gears. Right. Time is not a stuff in that way. Right. Is time real? Good question, right? Lots of questions like that are questions in metaphysics, okay? So, I mean, we'll see some of those. A God is certainly, is there a God? How do you know? That's a metaphysical question. Okay, value judgments, axiology, right? Aesthetics. Is beauty in the eye of the, op uh, of the beholder, right? Is it in the object or in the eye? You know what I'm saying, right? Money, I mean, I talked about this already. Money values and economics, they drop with fear. Are they subjective or objective? They seem objective. When it comes to ethics, values seem relative to cultures. You know, the natives of Alaska, before it became illegal, would be allowed to uh, kill their babies if they had too many of them. Right? We think that that's a horrible thing. So is it subjective, objective? Right? Epistemology, like I said, is about thoughts in the head. Metaphysics is about... Objects outside the head, where are our values? In the head or out in the world? It's not clear. Right? Two big important words, objective in the mind. Uh, no, independent of the mind. Right? Exists outside the mind, like the moon. Or subjective, which means exists somewhat all, entirely in the mind. Right? And there's also a blend intersubjective, which means something like it's subjective, but... Everybody who has a mind experiences it the same way, or everyone who has eyes and a nose and so on experiences it the same way. All right? So um, I'm going to pause here and cut this tape and pick it up so the tape's not too long. And um, it will be a part two, maybe a part three.